Good morning. Welcome to the Heritage Foundation and our Lewis Lehrman Auditorium. Of course, we welcome those who join us on all of these occasions on our heritage.org website. I would ask everyone here in-house, I'm assuming James has, to turn off cell phones and other noise-making devices before they intrude upon his remarks later. Uh, we, of course, will post the program on our Heritage homepage for everyone's future reference. And for those that are viewing on the internet, you're welcome to send questions or comments at any time, simply emailing us at speaker at heritage.org. Hosting our event today is our Ronald Reagan Distinguished Fellow Emeritus at the Heritage Foundation, as well as the former 73rd Attorney General of the United States, our colleague Ed Meese. Mr. Meese. Good morning. It's a pleasure to join in welcoming you here to Heritage and to be listening today to uh, what I consider our Renaissance man uh, here at, at Heritage. Uh, James Swanson is uh, a lawyer, uh, he's an author, he's a historian, and he's also a curator of political uh, artifacts. And so it's uh, great to have him here as our speaker this morning. Uh, he's, his official title is uh, as a senior legal scholar in the Heritage Foundation's uh, Center for Legal and Judicial Studies. He's a graduate of the University of Chicago and the UCLA School of Law. He served as a law clerk to uh, Judge and uh, past uh, Chief Judge Douglas Ginsburg on the United States Court of Appeals uh, for the D.C. Circuit. <coughs> In the administration of Ronald Reagan, uh, he first served as legal advisor for the uh, for the uh, United States, or rather, for the uh, Court of uh, the U.S. International Trade Commission. And then during the time that I was Attorney General, uh, he worked in the Department of Justice in the Office of Legal Counsel. Among the projects that he worked on uh, was the uh, battle to confirm Judge Robert H. Bork uh, on the seat on the, uh, on the uh, United States Supreme Court, uh, unfortunately one of the greatest uh, disappointments in uh, judicial history, in my opinion. But he did a great job in, in working on that particular project and uh, has remained uh, throughout uh, the life of, uh, of Judge Bork as a, as a very close friend. As I mentioned, uh, uh, James wears uh, the hat in addition to being the lawyer, <coughs> excuse me, but also as the uh, New York Times uh, best-selling author. Uh, his Edgar-winning uh, book entitled Manhunt, <coughs> excuse me, The Twelve-Day Chase for Lincoln's Killer uh, became uh, required reading here in Washington, D.C. Among those who have read, uh, written it or read it uh, on a bipartisan basis were President George W. Bush, uh, Senate Majority Leader uh, Harry Reid, uh, and the Republican leaders in both the House and, and the Senate, uh, Mitch McConnell and John Boehner. The uh, Newsweek magazine praised Manhunt uh, along with, uh, and said along with Truman uh, Capote's book, uh, In Cold Blood, as two of the best nonfiction crime books ever written, which is high praise from that particular publication. Now for the 50th anniversary of one of the darkest days in American history, uh, James has returned with a new book, uh, which uh, is available, by the way, afterwards uh, for your purchase, entitled End of Days, The Assassination of John F. Kennedy, which is a gripping account of the murder and its aftermath. Uh, not only is End of Days uh, a history of what took place on a moment-by-moment -moment basis of the, the events of Dallas, but it also probes for the deeper meaning of this incident. It asks questions such as, who was Lee Harvey Oswald and why did he do it? How were the conservatives wrongly blamed initially for the assassination? And now, half a century later, uh, who was the real John F. Kennedy? Doug, B Doug Brinkley, who was a best-selling author himself and the editor of the Reagan Diaries, uh, has called uh, James Swanson one of America's greatest historians, and I would certainly agree. And Pulitzer Prize-winning author John Meacham has called him a master and praises End of Days as, quote, a grand narrative at its finest, unquote. So that's what we have to look forward to here and what you have the opportunity to look forward to uh, on your own by buying the book. And so it's a pleasure to ask you to join me in welcoming James Swanson to the podium here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, General Meese. 
Um, it's been a tradition whenever I have a new book come out, the first public event is always here at the Heritage Foundation. And for the last two, General Meese has been the kind host. Uh, I think back to the Reagan time and the 80s. And I remember the first time I met General Meese, and I soon concluded that he was the humblest man I'd ever met in public life. Uh, we, we nobodies at the junior level at, at Justice were in awe of him, and he treated us the way he would treat a U.S. Senator. And his personality is the, the same today. Uh, in one of the eulogies for John Kennedy, uh, written by Charlie Bartlett, the journalist who introduced John and Jackie at a dinner party that led to their marriage, uh, that night Bartlett wrote at the White House the night of the assassination, we had a hero for a friend. And all of those who worked at Justice uh, under President Reagan and General Meese certainly think that of General Meese. So thank you for introducing me today. November 22nd, 1963. Do you remember? I, I can see some of you do. Some of us are just old enough to remember that day. If you do, you remember where you were when you heard that it happened. Uh, it seems like yesterday in a way, doesn't it, for those of us who remember? I can't believe it was 50 years ago. Uh, I have a little personal memory of it that I'll share, and it's one of the reasons I wrote this book. Every book I've ever written comes out of something I learned or experienced as a child. I was born on Lincoln's birthday and developed a lifelong, really, obsession with Abraham Lincoln, and I wrote the book Manhunt because it was the book that no one had ever written that I always wanted to read, of hour by hour, moment by moment, sometimes even second by second account of the Lincoln assassination. And my last book was about the hunt for Jefferson Davis, the Lincoln funeral, things that had interested me since I was a child. I remember nothing about the assassination of President Kennedy on November 22nd, 1963. I was four years old. I was at home with my mother. But I do remember vividly, like it was yesterday, Sunday, November 24th, 1963. I remember that morning because my mother said, Get dressed, change out of your pajamas, put your clothes on. The girls are coming over to watch television. Uh, these were my older playmates. They were seven and 10 years old. They lived across the street. They were daughters of a very conservative Greek grocer who decided that both his girls were going to go to Harvard. One ended up going to Harvard Medical School. One slummed it and went to my college, University of Chicago. <laughs> and as part of his program of educating them, they were never allowed to watch television. They didn't even own a television. So I remember thinking, this is a big thing. Why are the girls coming over to watch TV? And I remember saying, Mom, why, why are they coming over? And she said, because the president has died, and we're going to watch a horse-drawn carriage take his coffin down Pennsylvania Avenue to the US Capitol, where there will be a memorial service in his honor. When I think of that story, it really feels to me like she told that to me last week. I've thought about it all my life. And after writing these books about the 19th century and Lincoln, I decided I want to write about something that actually happened in my lifetime. I didn't remember it much, but it happened in my lifetime. Uh, one of the disadvantages about writing about Abraham Lincoln and the Civil War is Lincoln's long gone. It was the era before motion pictures or sound recording. The people who knew the people who knew the people who knew Abraham Lincoln are all dead. The, uh, one of the exciting things about writing about something in modern history is I was able to actually speak to people who were in Dallas. I spoke to people who went to school with Jackie Kennedy, girlhood friends. I, I read an undiscovered batch of, of Jackie's love letters that no one had found uh, for the last 48 years. And I was able to speak to people like Clint Hill the Secret Service agent who leaped on the back of the limousine and pushed Jacqueline Kennedy back into the car after the shots were fired. Uh, so it was exciting to meet eyewitnesses and people who had participated in the story. It's such a huge topic. It's, it's tough to, how to figure out how to talk about it in, in a brief talk that we're going to do now because I want to leave time for questions. I thought I'd talk a little bit about what happened that day in Dallas. Who were the principal players? What did they do? And I want to talk a little bit about Jackie's story, too, because that's one thing that I don't think has been covered in a lot of the books and the way I wanted to read about it. Because in a way, her life, as she knew it, ended that day in Dallas, too. Then I want to talk some, about some of the strange questions. 
Is it really the fault of the conservatives, like everybody said in 1963? Was Dallas the city of hate? Did we in the right wing kill John Kennedy? Much of America believed that. Of course, it's not true. I'll, I'll explain a little about why I think that. Who, who really was Oswald? Why did he do it? Do we know? Was he alone? What's with the conspiracies? theories. And then I think the big takeaway from this story, who was John Kennedy? As we look back half a century, who was he really? What was he like? What did he stand for? Uh, a lot of the things about him are not what we think they are. And I'm going to point out how much he was like Richard Nixon in certain ways, how much John Kennedy was like Ronald Reagan in certain ways. That, that is quite shocking to people who view things through the partisan lens and they, they can't believe how conservative JFK was in so many ways. I'm not going to read from the book, but I, I thought just to sort of get us in the mood and, and set the stage, I just want to read three passages I just put together. They're only about 250 words each to sort of set the stage and then I'll get into what happened that day. This first little vignette is about Lee Harvey Oswald. He'd been planning the assassination even before he bought the rifle. Lee Harvey Oswald had chosen, chosen his victim, scouted the location, written detailed notes in his journal, drawn maps and diagrams, photographed the building, and had even planned his escape. But in the spring of 1963, Oswald's target was not the President of the United States, John Kennedy. He wanted to murder another man the notorious anti-communist conservative army officer, Major General Edwin A. Walker. Furious that Walker seemed to want to invade Cuba and kill Castro, Oswald's hero, Oswald decided that Walker must die. So on the night of April 10th, Oswald went to Walker's home in Dallas, Texas, acquired the general in his rifle scope through a glass window, aimed at his head, and fired. Oswald was only 40 yards away, 120 feet. In the Marine Corps, Oswald had been taught to hit targets at up to 600 yards without a sight. He shot at 200 yards, 400 yards, 600 yards. Walker is only 40 yards away. The bullet struck a window frame, deflected, missed Walker's head by an inch. Undetected, Oswald ran off into the night. But it was really a psychological turning point. It was the t first time that he had ever tried to kill a man. He had joined the Marine Corps in peacetime and had never fought in battle. Shooting a rifle at a human being was novel, and it excited him. Yes, he'd failed, but he really enjoyed planning and carrying out this sniper attack. He wanted to keep his diary about it as a souvenir until his wife Marina said, are you insane? The police will find that. Mm -hmm. So she made him tear out pages of, of this murder diary or murder plan set them on fire, and one by one flushed them down the toilet so no evidence would be found. Some did survive. That experience taught Oswald a valuable lesson. In Dallas, he could shoot at a man and get away with it. And the failure of the police to catch him emboldened him and really enhanced his smug attitude of superiority. Now the taste for blood was in his mouth. He didn't know it in April 1963, but in a little more than seven months, he would select another human target. But next time, Lee Harvey Oswald would not have to spend weeks stalking his victim. The next man who appeared in his rifle sights would come to him on the brilliant sunny fall afternoon of November 22, 1963. In a nutshell, that's Oswald. I think it's of vital significance that John Kennedy was not the first man that Lee Harvey Oswald tried to kill. He told his wife he wanted to, quote, kidnap a plane and fly it to Cuba. She said he was crazy. He asked for her help. She said no. She didn't tell the police about his attack on Walker because she was not a US citizen. She was afraid she'd be deported, might lose one of her children who was born in the United States, not the Soviet Union where she was from. He said he wanted to see Nixon speak. She tried to hold him in the bathroom so he couldn't come out until he cooled off. Um, she said my husband would have been happy nowhere she told the Warren Commission, maybe on the moon. 15-year-old high school dropout, possibly dyslexic, lifelong failure, slept in his mother's bed till he was 11 years old with his strange mother who moved across the country having multiple husbands, failing businesses, tried to stab a family member with a knife when he was a kid. 
had dreams of grandeur. He told Marina, one day I'm going to be prime minister. In 20 years, I'll be the prime minister. And she told him, that's for educated people. You have no skills. You have no knowledge. You're a high school dropout. She essentially told him, you are a loser. <laughs> of course, and this is another thing forgotten about his profile, he was a vicious wife beater. He almost strangled her to death one night. She said, you have no right. He tried to strangle her anyway. The classic wife beater's defense, he said, I can't stand it when you make me mad. It's all your fault, Marina. So she endured that. And uh, he adopted Cuba after he went to the Soviet Union, came back disenchanted, hating the Russians. He thought communism in Russia was corrupt and evil, so he switched his allegiance to Castro in Cuba. Handed out leaflets in New Orleans, fair play for Cuba, said, he, he said, the leaflet said, hands off Cuba. He was arrested. Reporters found him. And in a little-known series of two interviews, Lee Harvey Oswald was a guest on a radio talk show in New Orleans where he debated anti-communists. It's interesting. I've listened to this broadcast a number of times. He doesn't sound crazy. He sounds a little unprepared, a little uneducated. But he's almost amused at the attacks he's getting. Uh, from Cuban exiles and others. And he seems to be enjoying himself. He jokes around a little. You can hear a lilt of laughter in his voice. And I think he thought, oh, I finally made it. I'm going to be a somebody now. I'm on radio. He was briefly on TV. But then he sort of faded into oblivion again. His wife had essentially told him, move to New Orleans after the Walker attack. Get out, get, get out of town. She said, for him, that rifle had become too dangerous a toy. He took it with him. She moved with him to New Orleans. She would often find him alone in their screen porch behind the house at night, in the dark, operating the bolt of the rifle over and over again, opening and closing it, opening and closing it, and often looking through this telescopic sight. So I think all these things are an important profile so that you realize Oswald just didn't emerge from nowhere and, and pop out that window and start shooting at the president. He was a violent man. He'd attempted to murder an army general. Uh, he beat his wife. He had delusions of grandeur. And he kept playing with that rifle. He didn't even know what he wanted to do with that rifle in New Orleans. Who, he, he didn't have a plan. He wasn't stalking Kennedy. Uh, fate brought them together. Uh, another little vignette. This is the morning of November 22nd in Texas. On that morning, President Kennedy was in his hotel room in Fort Worth. He was reading the Dallas Morning News. A full-page ad irked him. It said, welcome, Mr. Kennedy, to Dallas. And it appeared to be a friendly greeting. But JFK saw that the rest of the ad contained 12 defamatory questions that accused him of being unpatriotic and soft on communism. And these charges incensed him. And the previous night in Dallas, someone had printed several thousand leaflets headlined, wanted for treason. And these handbills resemble an old West style reward poster with mug shots of the criminal on the loose, in this case, the 35th president of the United States. Was this the kind of welcome he should expect when Air Force One landed in Dallas later this morning? JFK warned his wife, we're heading into nut country. But Jackie, he added, if somebody wants to shoot me from a window with a rifle, nobody can stop it. So why worry about it? Kennedy had often discussed this with one of his top aides, Dave Powers, that it'd be so easy for someone to shoot him with a rifle from a tall building. This morning, JFK couldn't seem to get that subject off his mind, and he reminded Jackie of their harried late-night arrival the previous night at Fort Worth at the hotel. Hundreds of strangers had surrounded them. It was very dangerous. These people were really pressing in on him physically. He was not adequately guarded. There weren't enough agents. The, the people were really on top of him. I've seen films of this, and he looks a little nervous. He says this morning now, November 22nd, you know, last night would have been a hell of a night to assassinate a president. There was the rain and the night, and we were all getting jostled. Suppose a man had a pistol and a briefcase and melted away into the crowd. Kennedy was a fatalist who lived with a sense of detachment and ironic humor. And he had always had an intuition that he might not live a long life. He had several brushes with death. One of his favorite poems was written by a fellow Harvard graduate, Alan Seeger, who had been killed in the First World War. I have a rendezvous with death, Seeger had prophesied. And often, 
in bed at night in the White House, JFK would ask Jackie to read this poem aloud to him. But Kennedy also believed that he was lucky and that luck had taken him all the way to the White House, where at age 43, he was the youngest man ever elected to the presidency. And on the morning of November 22nd, he was 46 years old. He'd been president of the United States for two years, 10 months, and two days. And as John Kennedy spoke in the safety of his hotel suite about guns and assassins, a man who wanted to kill him was already waiting, him, waiting for him in Dallas. He had a rifle, and he was in a tall building. I won't narrate what happened. Uh, that's in the book, you know, those 10 seconds on Elm Street. Uh, some, of, some of what I had to write about, I prefer even not to read aloud and just read it in print, and I, I commend it to you. I did try to do the most moment-by-moment, split-second, split-second account of what happened when that car turned on Elm Street. I will mention one thing, uh, sort of prematurely about the conspiracy theories. You've heard it all, the grassy knoll, multiple assassins, uh, up to 16 shots. Here's what really happened. And this is really for a lot of the people who say no shots were fired from the book depository. Some people actually believe that no shots were fired from the book depository. Three of Oswald's co-workers were sitting in the fifth floor windows directly below Oswald's window. They heard boom, boom, boom. They heard the rifle bolt open, eject a cartridge, and close three times. They heard those three brass cartridge cases bounce on the wooden floor above their heads. One of them said, man, somebody's shooting right above our heads. The windows were shaking. Plaster fell through cracks in the wooden floor and fell down on them. And they were all black, and they had short Afro haircuts. And one of them said, look at your hair, man. It's all in your head. And uh, they listened to the three shots. Most of the witnesses in De La Plaza heard three shots. People in the car, in the Secret Service trail car, all turned around to look at the book depository. That's just one little example of if I try to put in all the facts that are often not discussed or forgotten. How many people remember that three men were in a window right below Oswald and heard the, the three shots? There are dozens of stories like that that get into further detail, and I've tried to get a lot of them in the book. Uh, Another thing that interests me very much about what happened that day is the story of Jacqueline Kennedy. You know, we, we think so much about what happened to the president, we forget what her life became after this. Um, she was stunned. It was the very end of a 45-minute motorcade. She said later, I looked at the tunnel ahead. I thought it'd be cool under the tunnel. We'd be soon at our lunch destination. The president was less than four minutes away from getting to his lunch destination after the 41-minute motorcade. Jackie had tried to put on her sunglasses, and he said, take those off. The people want to see you. A few days before at the White House, she had laid out the clothes she planned to wear on this trip, and she held one outfit and another in front of her body so he could see and, and approve them. And one was a uh, bright pink suit, almost fluorescent in color. The reporters noticed it when she got off the plane. They said, she's wearing a bright pink suit. It almost seems to absorb and, and reflect the color of the sun and the red roses she's been presented uh, contrast beautifully with the, with the pink suit. A lot of the journalists talked about this pink suit. It's very unusual color, very striking. And so they're in the car. Nellie Conley, the wife of the governor, turns to JFK just before it happens and says, you, you can't say that Dallas doesn't love you today, Mr. President. It was thought he was going to get a hostile reception, but he had great crowds. People were happy to see him throughout the Texas trip. Great welcome in this motorcade in Dallas. Then they turn onto Elm Street, and that's when Oswald springs into action. Uh, first shot missed the car. Second shot, the so-called magic bullet, which wasn't so magical, struck the, Ken the president in the lower neck, upper back, whatever you want to call it, penetrated the body struck the governor of Texas. Conspiracy buffs always say it's pristine and perfect. That's an utter lie. The bullet was damaged by penetrating two men. If you look at the bullet from behind, it's flattened. It began to tumble. It hit Conley sideways in the back, 
flattened in shape, and there's damage to the nose of the bullet, and it's obviously squeezed, as though you put it in a vice. So there is no magic bullet. There is no perfect bullet that's undamaged and pristine. It's been a lie for 50 years. Whatever really happened or didn't happen is a separate question, but it's a complete and utter lie that there's a perfect magic bullet that's undamaged. It's just not the case. The president knew what was happening. You've seen the Zabruder film. His arms lock up in a neuromuscular reaction because the bullet passed close to his spine. This is where Jackie's nightmare really begins. She turns to him. You can almost see she's about to say, what's wrong, Jack? She tries to push his left arm down with her right hand. Her face is in front of his, and she's staring into his eyes, wondering what is going on. She said he had this shocked look on his face. Then, of course, that's when Clint Hill, the Secret Service agent, knew the president had been hit. The car was just 10 feet behind the president's car. He sprints off. He's seen it all. He barely grabs under the car. He leaps on. Then the final shot comes. And that was the headshot that killed the president instantly, in my opinion. I don't think he lived to get to the hospital. They did treat him, but it was the president of the United States, so they had to. So Jackie gets up. You've seen it. She turns around. She stretches her body. She's not trying to escape the car. Her knees are on the upholstery of the rear seat. What she's trying to do is reach for part of his skull that's on the back of the car. She thinks the doctors might need it later when they fix him. Clint pushes her back in. They speed to the hospital. She says to Clint, my God, Clint, they shot his head off. I've got his blood and brains all over me. They get to the hospital. She won't let him take him out of the car. They tell her, please, Mrs. Kennedy, let, let us take him. She says, why? He's dead. Just leave me alone. Hill takes off his jacket, covers the president's head. Jackie doesn't want anyone to see it. They take him back in, treat him. He's pronounced dead. That begins an interesting part of the Jackie story. She wants to enter the emergency room. A nurse, a burly nurse, won't let her. And Jackie says, I'm going into that room. I want to be with him when he dies. Jackie pushes the nurse. There's, there's going to be a fight between the first lady and a nurse. An admiral comes up, the president's personal physician, and says, her, it is her right. Open that door. So from that moment, Jackie decides she will not leave her husband. She waits. They take the body to Air Force One. She rides in the hearse. After the swearing in of Lyndon Johnson, and she won't change her suit, she says, I want them to see what they've done. So everyone in the plane is shocked when she comes out covered with blood. She goes and sits by the coffin during the entire trip home. She accompanies it in a motorcade to Bethesda Naval Hospital, where there's an autopsy and an embalming. It takes hours. She gets home to the White House at 4.30 in the morning on the 23rd, sleeps for a few hours. Then the president goes on several journeys. He goes, first he lies in repose at the White House. She views him for the first time there. He's taken to the US Capitol, taken back, taken to St. Matthew's Cathedral for the funeral, taken to Arlington. On each of those trips, she's always with him and rides with the coffin. Because she's starting to think it's her duty to give account of his administration and of the man who he was. And she's going to secure that legacy. Um, some strange things happen, too. And I'll mention one of these bizarre episodes. I, I really feel I must, because it's really the first time in my life that I found myself a two-page spread about my book in one of the tabloid uh, magazines, the National Examiner. Uh, one of my minor findings in the book, of, of little consequence compared to the emotional story I tell, it is true President Kennedy's brain is missing. He was buried without it, and his brother Robert took it, and we still don't know where it is. That's it in a nutshell. You can read the rest in the New York Post and the Examiner and in my book, not to conceal evidence of a conspiracy, but to conceal evidence of uh, how sick JFK was. He presented that image of vim and vigor to the American people. He was really the, the physical symbol of the new frontier, touch football, sailing, uh, playing with children. But he had Addison's disease, uh, chronic bowel syndrome, terrible back pain where he might have to lie down for a week. If he lift up a golf club, 
he might collapse in agonizing pain. All that was kept secret from the American people. So I'm convinced that the reason Robert Kennedy took the slides, the blood samples, the brain, uh, is to preserve that image of JFK, of, of, of Camelot. Uh, but I don't think there's anything to it in terms of a, of a conspiracy. And speaking of those, how, how can you not talk about those? I'll, I'll mention that in brief. Uh, there were dizzying and conflicting variety of them. You've heard them all. It was the pro-Castro Cubans. It was the anti-Castro Cubans that JFK betrayed at the failed Bay of Pigs invasion. It was the Soviets. It was naval intelligence. It was a central intelligence agency. It was the Cubans. It, I said that already. It was the mob. It was the mafia. It was Lyndon Johnson himself. And uh, I might have forgotten someone. Uh, oh, it was the, the oil business. Uh, I think I've covered most of them. Dave, have I got most of them? Mobsters. Oh, the Secret Service. Secret Service and, and, and some faction of the mob. Uh, the theories are fascinating. And I won't get into them in detail. But my argument is, 50 years later, no one has yet disproved with evidence the central conclusion of the Warren Commission, which is three shots were fired from that sixth floor book depository. All the shots were fired by the man who owned that Malinger Kirkconner rifle, Lee Harvey Oswald. It was Oswald who less than an hour after the station murdered a Dallas policeman by shooting him four times. While the policeman's lying helpless on the ground, Oswald pointed the pistol at his head, shot him through the brain, and said, poor dumb cop. Then Oswald's arrested in the Texas theater with that pistol, which he draws on officers who arrest him as he shouts, this is it. Start with the known facts. It's impossible to prove, disprove wild theories by saying they're not true. Start with what we know happened. We know a lot more about the assassination than the Warren Commission ever did. We've got a lot more evidence than they had. They didn't know about the CIA plots to kill Castro. They didn't know about certain scientific evidence available to us today. Uh, so in, in light of the more that we know and the more science we have, it becomes to me less likely that it was anybody but Oswald. I'm convinced that a century from now, people will look back in time and say, can you believe there was once a time when it was believed by hundreds of millions of people that it was a wild conspiracy and it wasn't Lee Harvey Oswald. I think the, the conspiracy movement has reached its high water mark now with the 50th anniversary and I think it will recede over time. Uh, I think I know why we believe these theories. Throughout American history, we've resorted to conspiracy theories to explain strange and horrible things in American life. We can't accept the fact that a nobody, a loser, a non-entity, a cipher man like Lee Harvey Oswald could change the destiny of a nation. And when you look at it from a conspiracy point of view, there is no chance, there is no accident, there's no coincidence. Of course, we know that chance, accident, coincidence have been part of human history for thousands of years. Conspiracists deny that. And so that's all I'll say about conspiracy theories. We don't know why he did it. He never left a record why. I have some speculation. Uh, maybe he did it to impress the Soviets or retaliate against them because they treated him like he wasn't important. He was furious at them. He hated Soviet life. Maybe it was to impress Castro, be celebrated as a great hero, revolutionary. Maybe he was one of our early celebrity thrill killers. He was mesmerized by the Kennedy's star quality and somehow, in a psychological disturbance, tried to merge his identity with theirs by killing the president. Maybe he just wanted to become famous. He once wrote to his brother, you got to take your chances when they come. And that chance came when he read in the newspaper a couple of days before, the president's driving right by the building where I got a job six weeks ago. My wife has left me. I'm a loser. I'll never be anybody. The president of the United States is driving past my window. And there's another explanation, possibly, one that we'd like to deny in the modern world. Maybe there is no explanation, and maybe Lee Harvey Oswald was just evil. We've seen evil in the world do other things. Why not Oswald? We'll never know why he did it. But I think those are some of the possible reasons. Let me conclude by who didn't do it and who didn't cause it. Chief Justice Earl Warren was a leader of the movement 
that said it was us, it was the conservatives. The conservatives created a climate of hate throughout America that made Oswald do it. Uh, no. Uh, <laughs> not true. Uh, Jackie Kennedy, the night of the murder, said, ha, I can't believe it was just some silly little communist. He didn't even have the pleasure of being killed for civil rights. And uh, it was unfair and unjust of Earl Warren to abuse that event at the U.S. Capitol Memorial and, and blame the climate of hate. Uh, it wasn't the fault of the city of Dallas. It wasn't the fault of political conservatives. Oswald was not a conservative. He was a leftist. He was a communist. Finally, who's JFK? One reason the election of 1960 was so close is because JFK and Nixon were so alike. They liked each other well. When JFK was almost dying as a senator, Nixon wrote in his diary, Dear God, please don't let this young man die. Virulent anti-communists. Strong believers in missile defense and in American greatness. Once Kennedy becomes president, here's what he believes. Tough engagement with America's enemies, missile defense, a love of special forces and counterinsurgency warfare, a will to dominate the space program and reach the moon, a true believer in American exceptionalism and greatness. John Kennedy thought he should unapologetically endorse American values and American greatness. He thought we had a special destiny. Is that starting to sound like someone named Ronald Reagan? JFK apologized to no nation and conducted his whole life that way. He loved American history, American arts, American greatness. Low taxes, by the way. When he spoke at, at the uh, American University in June 63 about the nuclear test ban treaty he saw with the Soviets, he didn't paste over the differences. He said at that speech, when he talked about our children's future, mutual cooperation, he said, communism is repugnant to the dignity of man. And he always said that. He was not afraid to name America's enemies. And so it's interesting to look back all these years and wonder, who is the real John Kennedy? Who did we really lose 50 years ago in Dallas? What would he have done if he had lived? What would he have done if he'd been reelected? Of course, he, w he wasn't Ronald Reagan-like in every way, but I find it fascinating that JFK believed in so many things that many of us in this room believe. It's just a fascinating historical question to wonder who was he really, what would he have become, and what would he have done? We'll never know the answers to those questions. These are just some of the things I try to explore in the book. Um, I think I'll, with that I'll stop so there's time for uh, questions or any discussion people would like to have. So thank you. James, thank you very much for an excellent uh, uh, precy of the book and uh, certainly uh, an intriguing uh, introduction that uh, I'm sure will cause a lot of people to be interested in reading the book and learning more about the topics you raised. Now it's an opportunity to ask questions and have you elucidate on uh, some of these things perhaps that you've raised and other questions that people might have. Who has the first question? John? Jane, James, you mm -hmm. mentioned, of course, all the conspiracy theories mm -hmm. probably goes back to the fact that Lincoln's was a conspiracy. Yes. Whereas Garfield and McKinley were not. Um, but you've left out one key player in your remarks, the Jack Ruby. Ah, uh, Jack Ruby. Um, first of all, if you look at the evidence and believe as I do that Lee Harvey Oswald was not part of a conspiracy. The Jack Ruby question becomes actually unimportant because if Oswald is not part of the conspiracy, why, is it, why would Ruby be sent to silence him? Here, here's my brief take on Ruby. Jack Ruby was a police buff, kind of guy who'd bring sandwiches to the late night shift, bribe radio hosts and detectives with passes to his sleazy strip club, the Carousel Club and other clubs. Jack Ruby was a punk, 
a thug who beat women, who pistol whipped customers, who pushed men downstairs, who had a volatile temper, who had no emotional self-control. He had a little dog that he called his wife and took the dog everywhere with him on trips around, around town. Jack Ruby was not a player in the mob. He was not taken seriously by any mobster. Jack Ruby was a low-life, frustrated loser. Throughout the weekend, he, he would come to the police station. He saw Oswald several times. He always carried a pistol because he carried a lot of cash around all the time from his strip clubs. He had been across the street wiring some money by Western Union to a stripper. Thought, I'll come and take a look. He walks down the, the car driveway into the police headquarters basement. Seventy cops down there. A lot of them recognize him. He says he sees Oswald with that smirk. And Oswald did come out with that smirk. A couple of policemen had him handcuffed. On the way down, one cop said, Lee, if somebody takes a shot at you, I want you down on that floor. And Oswald said, ah, nobody's going to shoot me. Ruby sees him, fires one shot. The police tackle him as they're dragging him to the ground. Ruby says to the cops, hey, guys, take it easy. It's me, Jack Ruby. <laughs> Uh, in a nutshell, Jack, Jack Ruby said he didn't want Jackie to come to testify. Jack Ruby was furious that a Jewish man had taken that Welcome to Dallas ad out in the paper, a guy named Bernard Weissman, and Ju Ruby was Jewish. He said, I wanted to show people that there were some tough Jews in Dallas. He was furious that a Jewish guy took out an anti-Kennedy ad. He was an emotionally troubled person, and that's who all Jack Ruby was. Bob? <coughs> I want to follow up on that. Uh, Get the, uh, the uh, here you the, the oh, yeah. I want to follow up on the Jack Ruby thing. <clears throat> it's my understanding that Jack Ruby indeed had connections with the uh, Chicago organization, that he was involved with Giancana. You're telling me that there was no connection between well, did Jack Ru Ruby and well, the, the, this Ruby, Chicago organization? Ru well, what is a connection? The, oh. this, not, that, not that you're doing this, but one of the favorite methods of conspiracy analysis is right. the connect the dots. If you know so-and-so who knows so-and-so who knows so-and-so, you're part of it. One little nutshell example, uh, a lot of the conspiracy people are complaining about, about me on the internet. <laughs> and here's why. Here's, here, here's a connection. I'm part of the conspiracy. Some of them uh, think that I was in the CIA. Of course I was never in the CIA. And they say that because I worked for Susan Liebler, the chairman of Ronald Reagan's International Trade Commission, and because Susan Liebler's husband, Jim, served on the Warren Commission, I must have been selected by Rupert Murdoch, the owner of my publisher, Harper Collins. And by the way, Murdoch is a member of the Trilateral Commission with Bush 41, and they were both involved in the murder. So therefore, I must be a puppet of the anti-conspiracy crowd. What, what these conspiracy people haven't figured out yet, Jim Liebler was actually my mentor at UCLA Law School. So my, my ties to this are even, of course, Ruby knew some people who knew some people who knew the mob. Ruby was a joke to serious mobsters. He wasn't a connected man. You know, you're involved in a sleazy business like that in, Dal in Dallas at that time. You're going to know some criminals. You're going to know somebody who knows somebody. But he was no mob operative. He was not a made man. He was not a trusted insider of organized crime. Thanks, Jim. Go ahead. <clears throat> I think most of us feel that what happened after Kennedy, the country started to fall apart. Uh, have you ever wondered in your own mind, would things have played out differently, maybe better, if he had lived and perhaps served another, another term? Yeah, it's hard to know what would have happened if JFK had lived. At the time of his death, he had 18,000 men in Vietnam. And uh, he was not unwilling to reach out into the world and do things. Uh, we'll never know. Uh, one of the curses that affected LBJ was that he was obsessed with carrying on Kennedy's mission. He begged all the people like McNamara to stay on. McNamara, the, the, organize, the principal organizer of our war in Vietnam. We go from 18,000 men under JFK to 500,000 LBJ. Who knows what would have happened? Maybe civil rights would have taken slower to progress. Like after Lincoln was killed, there was quick passage of the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. JFK was not a great civil rights hero. LBJ was the better civil rights man. Uh, Bobby was the one who authorized the wiretaps of Martin Luther King that Edgar Hoover used to try to get King to commit suicide. Uh, the, the Kennedys didn't want the march on Washington to happen. A whole, whole bunch of other things. So maybe JFK's death accelerated the progress of these, the Civil Rights Act, the Voting Rights Act. Who knows? Uh, people do think there's a popular belief that the murder unleashed dark forces that led to uh, racial violence, 
civil unrest, the murder of Robert Kennedy, the murder of Martin Luther King, the murder of Robert Kennedy. And many think of, of, the, of the JFK time as a sort of golden age of innocence. But it wasn't. Camelot was a myth constructed by Jackie a week after the assassination. We look back and think it was this wonderful golden age where everything was right. But it wasn't the case. Uh, I just don't know what Kennedy would have done. He certainly would have kept going with the space program. I think he would have continued his engagement with, with communists and been a, a, a anti-communist throughout his, his term, uh, big defender of human rights and human dignity. We don't know what he would have done in Vietnam. Some of his former aides say, oh, he told me he was going to pull out. He never told them that. They've, they've fantasized that. He could have pulled out. He could have gone all in. We don't know. Another question in the back. First of all, congratulations on your awesome book reviews that are coming out on the book. Thank you. Um, I wonder if you could assess the impact of the Zapruder film, which is, you know, a live, in color, first, you know, person account, that what the impact that would have been with, you know, without the film, but with it, and it really seared the consciousness of Americans in it. And I guess a lot of it wasn't released for four or five or Ten well, even longer. The, the Zabruder film is certainly one of the most famous cultural artifacts in American <clears throat> history. Uh, recently, the U.S. government had to pay the Zabruder family $17 million to take it from them, the original camera negative. Uh, the, uh, 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 a law passed by Congress says the government must collect and take possession of all artifacts of the Kennedy assassination, and there's a big battle with the Zabruders. Uh, the government wanted to pay $50,000, and the arbitrators gave them $17 million. They likened it to an Andy Warhol painting or a Lichtenstein painting. Of course, Abraham Zabruder filmed part of the assassination. He didn't get the shot that hit the president because the president's car was behind a sign. But you do see Clint Hill, Jackie, the headshot. Would you be surprised to know, because many people think they saw it live or saw it that day or that year, would, would you be surprised to know that the Zabruder film was not shown on American television until 1975 when Geraldo Rivera showed it on, on his show? And he warned everyone, this is going to be very shocking. Send all children out of the room. I hate to show it, but I will. And, <laughs> and, and so Life magazine published stills from the Zabruder film. I, I think in America there must be 10,000 dreams a night across the country where people are dreaming the frames of the Zabruder <laughs> film. It, it's certainly the most, one of the most famous piece, pieces of imagery in world history. Without the Zabruder film, I don't know if we'd know completely what happened. I, we might not have known the sequence of the shots. Uh, there are a lot of things we might not have known. And one, thing, I'm, one good thing about the Zabruder film, as shocking as it is, it supports the argument that it was Oswald. It supports the argument there were three shots for all kinds of reasons of people moving in the film, what happened in this frame, what happened in that frame. Uh, it, it supports the idea that Oswald did have time to operate that bolt three times. And a fourth time. He reloaded for a fourth shot. He could have shot Jackie. He chose not to take that shot. So the Zabruder film is certainly at the core of this whole story. Uh, and I think if it didn't exist, there'd be a lot more mystery. I've got a question. Uh, James, talk about the Warren Commission, how that came about, uh, who was on it, who the, how they were selected, and uh, what the impact of, of the Warren Commission was. Well, the Warren Commission, uh, a few days after the assassination, by executive order, uh, mm -hmm. President Johnson ordered the creation of the so-called Warren Commission, actually the President's <coughs> Commission on the Assassination of President Kennedy, etc. But it got its name, its nickname, because it was headed by Chief Justice of the United States, Earl Warren. He didn't want to do it. LBJ, like LBJ did with so many men, made him do it. LBJ said, okay, if you want to tell me that the veteran and Chief Justice won't serve his country at a time when there was worldwide speculation of what happened, Go ahead and stay home. And Earl once said, I'll do it. Uh, seven, seven principal members, uh, Richard Russell, Hale Boggs, Gerald Ford, Alan Dulles, at the top of my head, I can't remember the others, w with a staff of 14 assistant councils, and below that, a staff of some, some junior councils. They had an impossible task. The president was killed on November 22nd. The Warren Commission was formed in November. And Lyndon Johnson wanted that report out before the presidential election of 1964. He wanted the story to be 
over by then. Not because he was covering up a conspiracy, <coughs> but because he didn't want it, the story to linger and involve the presidential election. He also hated the idea that Bobby Kennedy was going to try to become his running mate. LBJ wanted to just put all the Kennedy things behind him and the country. Well, so the commission released its report around September 24th or 27th, 1964. That's only 10 months after the assassination. They compiled 26 volumes of evidence. The whole Warren Commission is this wide on my shelf. They had a summary volume of almost 1,000 pages, 300,000 words. And uh, a lot of people mock the Warren Commission as being a cover-up or being sloppy. It's, it's a mass, it's like an Iliad and Odyssey of American history. It contains incredible, fascinating, and important revelations and information. And anyone who discounts the Warren Commission as useless or false or, or doctored or, or, or is completely wrong. Uh, if you read a lot of the Warren Commission, as I've done, and it's very tiny type, so much is in there. So much is in there. It's, it's the, one of the key primary sources, along with several other important sources. Uh, so given the time limits available, given that the principal seven did not do much of the work, they, they delegated it to their staff, uh, given that there were some disagreements on the Warren Commission, they couldn't figure out the first two shots. They thought maybe the first shot hit the president and the second one didn't. They made some mistakes. It's sprawling and massive, but it contains vital information. And I think they did about as good as they could have done, given the limitations on their time and that the FBI and CIA were not sharing everything they knew with the Warren Commission. Uh, Gerald Ford was right. It, it has stood the test of time. I really think it has, you know, with, with certain <coughs> mistakes and improvements that we know since then. Any other questions that anyone has? If not, James, thank you very thank much you, for Mace. writing the book and for being here with thank us you. today. Thank you. And you'll find uh, books available outside, and James will be here uh, or just outside, outside the door uh, for those of you who may want a book inscribed.